is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Now, what should have ended in a fresh new government mandate on August the 8th instead resulted in a frenzy of uncertainty. Since Kenya's Supreme Court decision to nullify the results of the last presidential run, tension has steadily risen. Tension that all came to a head earlier this week. And beyond all the disputes raised by both the Jubilee and NASA parties, what still remains seems to be a country divided roughly down the middle. But regardless of the outcome of this rerun, this is not the first time Kenya has faced problems at the polls. In 2013, Raila Odinga also challenged the outcome in court unsuccessfully. The 2007 election saw violence follow in 2008 on such a large scale that the International Criminal Court was asked to investigate. So when it comes to electoral outcomes, why do simple solutions continue to evade the East African nation? And what further steps need to be taken in order to solve Kenya's democratic dilemma? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, politics in Africa is never dull. Even so, few would have predicted the drama we've seen in Kenya these past few months. And it's far from over. So just how did Kenya get there? CGTN's Jen Keo has a story so far. It was a fierce political contest from the word go. Eight candidates were on the ballot, but in reality, as with the 2013 election, the battle was between these two, the incumbent Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga, making his fourth attempt at the presidency. August 8th, the enthusiasm among Kenyan voters quite evident, with long queues across the country. For three days, Kenyatta maintains a 10% lead in the provisional results relayed at the National Tallying Center. I wish to declare Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta as president elect. Three days later, Honorable August 11th, IEBC, the Electoral Commission, declares Kenyatta winner by 54 to Odinga's 45%. Odinga immediately disputes the results as protests break out in opposition strongholds. A nine-year-old girl among the first casualties. August 19th, at the 11th hour, the opposition submits tens of thousands of documents as it files a petition at the Supreme Court. It claims the vote was rigged. 1st of September. The presidential election held on 8th August 2017 was not conducted in accordance with the constitution. Odinga would score a victory in what would be an unprecedented decision, not just in Kenya, but Africa, as the Supreme Court nullifies the election, citing irregularities, and orders a new vote within 60 days. The reaction was immediate with the president describing the Supreme Court judges as a bunch of crooks. On September 4th, the Electoral Commission announces the new vote will be on the 17th of October, but later moves it to the 26th, which is five days short of the 60-day deadline allowed by the Constitution. The commission says it needs time to prepare. Now, as far as we are concerned, it is not just you know, the date. There have been signs Odinga is not actually keen for a rerun, while Kenyatta has been traversing the country on the campaign trail, Odinga's side has barely held any kind of rallies. After deliberating on our position, on Tuesday, October 10th, Odinga withdraws, claiming the Electoral Commission has not reformed. Kenyatta says he is ready to proceed with a rerun. And then on October 11th, the High Court rules that the other candidates from August 8th should also be allowed to run. It to form. With just a week to the poll on the 18th of October, IEBC Commissioner Rosalina Kombe resigns, saying a credible election is impossible. Hours later, the Commission's Chair Wafula Chebukati says the Commission is all set. Good afternoon. But that he cannot guarantee the poll will be free and fair. Welcome to the Supreme Court. This admission would be one of the reasons three voters would seek to block the vote last minute on October 25th. Following the events of last night, 
The case, however, fails due to a lack of quorum of judges to make the decision. Hours later, opposition leader Raila Odinga would hold a rally announcing that his party had now transformed into a resistance movement. When injustice becomes law, resistance becomes a duty. And I further believe that all of us, including those that we have charged with the responsibilities and governance, will also put aside partisan ambitions to participate in the democratic process once again. October 26th, there is voting, but a stark difference from the August 8th election. Jane Keo, CGTN. And now to offer insights into Kenya's situation and what exactly has led the country to this point. I have expert guests standing by in London, Rebecca Rumpel. She's a research assistant in the Africa program at Chatham House. And in studio with me, Delano Kilulongwe. He's uh, a security expert, Protective and Safety Association of Kenya. And also Daisy Mdani. She's a political analyst and executive director, Community Advocacy and Awareness Trust. You all, thank you for joining us on the program. Daisy, I'm going to start off with you because it's been a dramatic time for Kenya since August the 8th. First, how did Kenya get here? What's been going on exactly? Well, Kenya got here when we nullified our presidential uh, election results, um, citing, and that was the Supreme Court, citing um, irregularities, illegalities, and failure to observe the constitution and applicable laws. And therefore, um, according to the constitution, a 60-day period was given within which another fresh election should be carried out, fresh pres presidential election. And of course, from that time, there's been a lot of drama. Uh, we have seen the official uh, leader of the opposition or the opposition boycott the election, citing uh, the, that it's not a fair playing uh, field and that they will not participate in what they are calling a coronation. All right, Dylan, I want to hear from you exactly what's going on. Beatrice, it's very interesting that we are in this scenario. I think this is one of the scenarios that have been simulated quite a number of times. That's why we have uh, the days and the timings down as an exact science, but it is something that the country has never had to walk through previously. So what we're walking through right now is a first-of-a-kind experience for the entire population of Kenya, as well as its leadership, both ruling party and opposition, which means there are numerous scenarios or aspects of those scenarios that could come into play that are unanticipated. That unanticipated aspect is what causes fear, uncertainty, mistrust, and doubt. And the reason why we're here is because we have, over time, uh, you know, looked at this from a very theoretical perspective, but we never really deeply delved into the practicality of what then would happen given this scenario or given that this particular party would choose a different uh, position rather than the kind of drawn out, written out, you know, one plus one equals scenario. Right now we're in a scenario where a few additional formulas have been added right. and, and from a perspective of as, uh, Kenya as a country and from a purely electoral perspective, it's completely unanticipated. What that does mean is that there's going to be fear, uh, there's uncertainty about what is going to be the end result of this, and unfortunately also, it does allow for a few doors to remain open for uh, uh, necessarily or unnecessarily people to take advantage of Let this. me bring in Rebecca at this point because I'm sure, Rebecca, you, you're watching this from London and of course, uh, the uh, former Prime Minister, Raila Odinga of the opposition, had been to Chatham House uh, a few weeks after the election. What is unfolding in Kenya? What's your view of what's happening here? I think it's a really interesting and difficult situation right now. Um, I think this kind of is, you know, this political stalemate that's arisen um, has really shown that the judicial reforms carried out after 2007 and 2008, um, you know, the kind of strength of those reforms and the strength of the Supreme Court and the judiciary um, overall, um, that they are now also kind of, you know, in a, in a difficult situation themselves. Um, it shows, I think, you know, the kind of scale of the 
of the difficulties now because not only is there political stalemate, but the Supreme Court has now fa also found itself in a really tricky situation. Right, uh, yes. Daisy. Um, I think Rebecca raises a fundamental concern because, um, you know, having a strong judiciary is good for the entire country, not just for the politics of the country, because the judiciary acts as a safeguard for the rule of law and is there to temper the excesses of power. The judicial reforms help to strengthen ju the judiciary and make them a fair arbiter, a place where Kenyans, any Kenyan could go and know that they would get a fair opportunity to be heard. What we are seeing now is a restriction on that, and that needs to be a concern for everybody, not just Kenyans, but also for foreign direct investors. Because when you don't have the assurance of an independent judiciary, then you have a problem. And when you have clearly politics manipulating or intimidating the judiciary and judges seemingly being intimidated, then this needs to concern all of us. Because then what happens is that we do not have an, an arbiter, a neutral arbiter, who can independently uh, and definitively interpret the Constitution and the law for us. Delano, the fact that um, opposition parties and the government, all of them ended up at the Supreme Court, this is an indication that Kenya's judicial processes have been reformed. The Judicial Service Commission did a lot of work, especially during the days of Chief Justice Willie Mutunga, in order for all these aspects to be looked into. However, a lot of it was theoretical. We did not have the experience of diving into the deeper uh, you know, waters of the practicality of things. So now we find ourselves as a country having jumped uh, you know, uh, deep into a scenario that was unanticipated. We didn't anticipate one or two elements. And that's what's bringing in all the fear, the apprehension, etc., about certain uh, aspects. And I'd like to agree with Daisy. You know, we previously haven't had uh, where you have the judiciary uh, based on the three arms of government, uh, such a keen focus on this particular arm of government. There has been a lot of pressure, there's been a lot of focus. Uh, you've seen tempers rising, you've seen a lot of uh, different types of interaction which right. we've never actually had the opportunity to see. And at a time when we still, as a country, are really laboring through an electoral process, which is a first-of-a-kind process. Daisy, so this leads to a challenge. Daisy, well, this does lead to a challenge. But one issue that has come out this week, though, is the fact that the Supreme Court had ruled previously based on the processes. If the process was not clear, then the end result was deemed not clear. However, when the second petition came before the court, the Supreme Court itself did not have a quorum. Is that a problem? It is a problem. And in fact, the fact that the, 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 the Chief Justice refused to hear the matter shows you that process does matter because he would have then gone ahead to make a decision on his own or the two judges who were available. But I want to um, pick up from where uh, Delano has uh, left off. When we talk about the judicial reforms, one of the things that we have not seen, we've not seen political reforms because the Constitution envisioned a uh, um, separation of powers where we have independent bodies because remember one of the challenges was right. that we had an imperial what we were calling an imperial presidency where the president was handled all the power uh, you know over the exec over the executive over the legislature and over the judiciary so we put in place a system that has all three arms of government working interdependently but independent so that none can then um, instruct the other or uh, you know um, as the speaker would say that you cannot the courts cannot injunct Parliament right but what we did not envision was an executive or a political class that refused to be fettered within the law because that's what we're seeing right now the the pushback that we're seeing is an executive and uh, not so much an executive, but a political class that doesn't want to operate within the boundaries and the restrictions that the rule of law has given us. I want Be to put that question, though, to Rebecca, because she's monitoring this uh, from overseas. Rebecca, we saw two things happen in regards to uh, what Daisy is speaking about. One, President Kenyatta did agree uh, you know, to abide by the Supreme Court ruling of the annulled election. But on the other hand, we did also see the opposition uh, boy deciding to boycott elections. Where are the political reforms here vis-a-vis -vis 
the judicial reforms? Well, yes. I mean, Kenya, uh, President Kenyatta did say um, that he will abide by the Supreme Court ruling and that he respects it. Um, but then he also said it on the same day that, you know, the, um, the justices, he called them crooks and said that he intends to pass reforms um, to the powers of the Supreme Court um, if once he is re-elected. Um, so I think that was quite concerning for a lot of um, people who'd been hoping, you know, that he really reaffirms the importance of the rule of law in Kenya. Right. Um, and I think it's very interesting as well to see the some of the, you know, s you know, some of the threats the ju justices have received um, or reported have reported that they've received, especially in the context of polling that's shown how popular the Supreme Court ruling was. So even, you know, across Kenya, more than 60% of people said in polls um, that they were pleased with th how the Supreme Court was behaving and its ruling. And that includes above 50% of people saying that, you know, they supported it even in, you know, kind of jubilee strongholds. Right. So I think that maybe um, that, you know, should be a more significant part of the narrative in Kenya right now. All right, uh, Delano, Daisy and Rebecca will continue with this discussion in just a moment. We are going to take a short break now, but when we return, we'll have more insights into Kenya's democratic dilemma. Stay with us. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Those who wish not to vote, I promise you that your rights not to vote shall equally be respected. But we must remember that no right supersedes the other. Those who wish to vote must be allowed to vote, just as those who wish not to vote must be allowed not to vote but our country must move forward. Consequently, when government is established contrary to the Constitution and the law, the defiance, becomes, uh, defiance and disobedience becomes an imperative. From today, we are transforming the NASA coalition into a resistance movement. Welcome back to Talk Africa. We continue our discussion now into the factors that have contributed to the Kenyan situation as it stands. And I still have my expert guest standing by in London, Rebecca Rampel, research assistant in the Africa program at Chatham House. And with me in studio, Delano Kinglu and Daisy Mdani. Rebecca, this is not the first time, though, that uh, Kenya has been faced with a seemingly uh, grave situation 2007 violent election after that election 2013 pretty much quiet but you know still not very calm so what is it exactly that has led kenya here and why isn't kenya unable to get it right when it comes to its democratic ideals i think it's important to view this election and you know the 2013 election and the 2007 election um you know as a as a path um, and not to see each of them in isolation, you know, as a moment of crisis. Um, I think there have been some structural advances. We've already talked about the importance of judicial reforms um, and, you know, the Supreme Court's importance now. Um, so I think, you know, compared to 2007 and 2008, we're nowhere near that kind of situation yet. Um, and that's partly because of these improvements that have occurred. I also think it's, you know, not quite right um, to compare this situation to other democracies around the world, um, including the US, for example. If in the US we had a situation where the last election was annulled, that would inevitably also lead to a moment of difficulty and a moment of crisis. Um, so Kenya is kind of, you know, one of the very few countries where that has occurred, where an election has been annulled right. um, by the highest court in the land. Um, and so I think this has been an opportunity, actually, um, for, yeah, some, you know, really big discussions, really important um, 
yeah, moment to kind of debate and consider what should happen going forward to continue that positive trajectory since 2007-2008. Daisy, is it just a difficult period uh, in Kenya for this particular crisis or Kenya is just seemingly unable to get a hold of it? I think it's part of the growing pains of democracy and, you know, birthing that new order because let's not forget that the crisis in 2007-2008 birthed the new constitution and we are still in transition because we're now testing the boundaries of that constitution. Uh, we're testing, uh, you know, the Supreme Court is laying down the law because remember when the Supreme Court did what they did, it was so as to enforce raising the standard of the electoral process to follow through with the rule of law. And while Delana talks about um, the economy, because a lot of people are trying to justify uh, going back to a sense of normalcy, the question that we really need to ask ourselves is, will we have a sense of normalcy? I don't think so. I think that going forward, we're now going to test the the, the essence of our democracy because democracy is about people being governed and, and being governed by the people that they choose and not being forced upon them, uh, processes being right. forced upon the people. And here we see, we have seen very heavy handed deployment of security and, and, and restrictions on you know, basic uh, but that heavy rights. handed, uh, what you call heavy handed uh, s setting out of the security though is because of trying to contain the violence, demonstrating I don't think so. in itself. I, I disagree completely, Beatrice, because while there have been some violent protests, we have clearly seen skewed application of the law. We have seen demonstrators from one side of the political divide not being treated the same as others. Now, I know for me personally, I always feel that this mass action right. gives an opportunity for elements to actually infiltrate and cause trouble, you know? And I always prefer that we go through, you know, the courts and if we're dissatisfied, look for other opportunities, perhaps even to dialogue. And there've been several calls for dialogue that have been resisted. There is the feeling that let's push through with the elections, let's be done with the electoral cycle, and then let's deal with the issues. Remember that those are the same issues. That, that's the same issue we had with the Constitution. Let me some hear Delano's the, voice the people, here because um, th there are a so, lot of issues coming okay, out in okay. this particular yeah. discussion. Delano, first, yes. of all, first of all, I, I think I'd want to disagree with Daisy uh, in terms of the perspective that, you know, we're waiting for the electoral and electoral process to finish in order to fix some of the problems we've seen, like the disparity in application of law and security. There are actual active measures that are being taken right now as we speak to actually bring proper training to the police force in order for them to actually execute impartially. These are some of the challenges that we've been looking at, as well as now back to an economic perspective and standpoint, we're seeing certainly that there is something, you know, the question we should all be asking, why so much political will being exerted? Why the ruling party, the opposition party fighting? What is there to fight for? And this is the question you need, everybody needs to ask. There is a price, uh, or rather a prize, at the end of all this. And what is that prize? For the first time in the history of Kenya, devolution has started working. We've already seen in counties like Kuala, where 63 billion US dollar projects are beginning to kick off. That's almost the size of the GDP of Kenya. In Bungoma, we're seeing 28.4 billion dollar uh, development projects right. kicking off. It means that there's a much bigger pie to go for. And that's what's fueling the drive and the intensity for I must win at this particular time. Rebecca. In terms of democracy, though, because, uh, you know, a lot of African countries now are young democracies. In terms of democracies, are elections now a true reflection of a country's democracy? I think it's one part only um, of, you know, a measure of democracy. Um, there are other key factors, you know, including rule of law, including the ability of um, grassroots organizations, of civil society, of organizations, of NGOs, um, of, you know, a variety of bodies, including trade unions, to meaningfully participate, um, and also of ordinary people to meaningfully participate. Um, so I think on that front, Kenya, you know, does have, for example, or has had, especially in regional comparison, a vibrant media, a very diverse range of actors taking part in politics. 
Um, I think as across the region, as across East Africa, we've seen this in Tanzania, etc. Um, there have been some threats to that as well. Um, you know, new laws being introduced to kind of ask organisations to register, um, you know, attempts to kind of shut down some space for participation. Right. Um, so I think although this election is an important measure um, of how Kenya's democracy ad is advancing, um, a really crucial thing to watch after the election is whether that, you know, right of the opposition and of non-political um, groups to participate is guaranteed and indeed, uh, you know, is expanded or restricted. Right. Edilano, moving forward. But the, what is likely, how is this Kenyan situation likely to pan out? It's very likely that there will be a winner. There will be a disappointed, disappointed loser and team of losers, but there will be a clear winner at the end of it all. And it's going to very swiftly move back into business as usual, because right now I can tell you from an informed position that there are actual steps being taken in many cases for very ultra large scale infrastructure projects taking place in the country. In terms of a security perspective, I think we're going to see a maturity also of the security environment in Kenya, both internally and externally, because Kenya plays a key role for regional stability and security. So we do see a scenario where within the next uh, period of time, we can't guarantee and say it's you know this week or next week, but we will come to an end of this. Right, uh, Daisy? I, you know, when you look at election boycotts, um, in most cases, what has happened is that uh, it has ended up having a very divided country. And let's not forget that we have a huge section of Kenyans who, will, who have voiced their concern and will not be participating in the, the, the uh, elections. So it only waits to be seen what will happen. I think moving forward that we're going to have you know, some more rumblings, you know, and uh, uh, some push and pull. Um, how we handle that as a country, how the leaders step up, because what has been lacking totally during this entire crisis has been leadership. What we've seen is just political brinkmanship. We're going to need leadership to steady the ship that is Kenya. Uh, moving forward because there is still a sense of exclusion um, not just from political players there are still people who feel excluded you know that as women we continue to fight the two-thirds gender principle for the full implementation of that so right. we still have a lot of exclusion that must be addressed so moving forward we're going to need to see leadership emerge from this crisis and I hope that as Kenya we will not waste another crisis and that something good will come out of it but I think that for some time we will see a little bit of difficulty, but I still believe that we do have better days ahead for Kenya, and I'm, I'm trusting that leadership will emerge from this. Right. Rebecca, moving forward, what are you likely or what are your expectations of Kenya? Well, I think it's crucial that, you know, there's some kind of resolution to this situation um, that is, you know, kind of, yeah, includes some of the people who feel marginalized um, and creates a situation that is ultimately creates a more stable 2022 election. Um, I think it's really crucial to look ahead to that date. Um, in terms of the region, yes, absolutely. I mean, you've got South Sudan, you've got Somalia. Um, Kenya is a linchpin um, for East Africa. Um, I really hope that a lot of that, you know, kind of civil society space and the progressive constitution are given space to continue, you know, um, to strengthen. Um, I hope that some of the people around President Kenyatta who have said um, that he would like to reduce some of those freedoms in his second term, I hope that doesn't play out. I hope we don't see that. And I hope that Kenya offers a countervailing trend to, to some of those more authoritarian trends across East Africa. All right, uh, Rebecca Rumpel joining us there from London. Thank you very much for your insight. And Delano Kilu and Daisy Amdani here with me in studio. Thank you very much for your insight in Nairobi here. And that's all we have time for on the program this week. Remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do tune in again next week for more Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall. Goodbye.